I usually only do it on, in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that the stream didn't just start. <laughs> All right, so live streaming. Uh, we have another very, um, can you use the word genius? Yeah, I don't think so. Another one of these geniuses that uh, like joined this project. I'm, I'm really humbled by everybody who's, uh, who's helping us. Uh, this is Stefano. He's gonna show you um, what uh, visual languages are and how they are extremely ubiquitous and uh, yeah, multifaceted. So, Stefano. Thank you very much. Um, hello, so I am uh, Stefano, I am a mathematician who likes to draw. That's a good characterization of what I do. I managed to spend uh, years being uh, uh, paid and pa publishing by just doodling on whiteboards, which I feel is an interesting success. So what I'm going to talk about today is one example of visual languages being really effective and really successful at describing something which is considered extremely complicated, which is quantum theory. Now, it's very hard to do quantum theory uh, with the usual kind of methods, because you need to know complex, uh, complex analysis, uh, complex linear algebra, you need to use tensors, these objects are very large. You can't draw conclusions by just looking at things. You have to do calculations and redo calculations and you will get them wrong. And that's not what you want when you implement a quantum computer or when you do an experiment because you just draw the wrong conclusion. So you need some better method of representing your objects. You need some better method of uh, encapsulating the complexity in such a way that what you don't want to use just goes away, disappears from sight, and you don't have to worry about it. And the formalism will do it for you. So this is something that uh, diagrammatic languages, as we call them, or string diagrams, have been very successful at. And I will just give you one example. So I will essentially go from zero to showing you how to do quantum teleportation, which I feel is uh, introductory enough. <laughs> so let's start with the basic building boxes. Basic building boxes are just boxes and wires. Now boxes are drawn as boxes, but not always. Let's start by drawing them as boxes. Uh, wires, you can think of as types. If you are of the programming uh, languages kind of persuasion, you can think of them as carrying some quantum system, if you are of the physics E persuasion, uh, you can think of them as wires if you are of the mass persuasion. They are actually wires and they may be such. While boxes have some inputs, which are wires coming in, they have some outputs, which are some wires going out, and they are black boxes so far. You don't really know what they do. It's just a box, it's there, it sits there. But the first thing you notice is that even with this basic formalism, you can start wiring things together and make some pretty complicated diagrams. The only rule in wiring things together is that you cannot mismatch types. So your wires have type annotations. They tell you what they are carrying. You cannot just join them together if they are carrying different things. If one wire is carrying a qubit and another wire is carrying a dog, you cannot just plug them together. The conversion has to be done by something. But otherwise, you can do pretty much everything you can imagine. You can bend wires around. And you can uh, bend wires up, and you can create new boxes which have smaller boxes inside with wires running wild and connecting in some weird way. And the funny thing is that you can express equations in this language as well. You can just say, I have two diagrams. They don't look the same at all. They are possibly very different. But as long as they have the same types or types which are equal or like I can claim to be equal, then I'm fine. I can just write an equation like that. From that equation, I cannot uh, determine anything about F and H, uh, A and B. Those boxes, I don't know what they do. All I know is that when I plug them that way, I obtain the same result. And this is just the graphical planar equ equivalent of normal equations. It's no different than uh, 1 plus 3 equals 2 plus 2. The equation 1 plus 3 equals 2 plus 2 does not tell you anything about 1, 2, and 3. It tells you about what they do when you put them together. But it doesn't tell you what they are inside. You don't know, for example, if one of those is prime, which two of them are. But the equation itself doesn't really tell you. But it allows you to compose things and to equate things and to do calculations. And this is just a graphical, diagrammatic equivalent of that. And we get some equations for free, because these are wires. We treat them as wires, so we can yank them. And so we can do some bands, and we can do some other bands, and we can conclude that we can just yank the wires down, and we obtain a new diagram, 
and we didn't have to do any calculation at all. That was just naturally how wires work. And we can do more. We can enrich our formulas a little bit, and we can introduce rotations and symmetries, and we can say that if we yank two wires, then we pull a box around, we rotate it. And we can flip it upside down. These things seem like uh, tricks or notational uh, frivolities, but actually they correspond to things which in quantum mechanics happen. One of them is just the transpose, the one is the adjoint. These are operations that you would do on objects which you deal with in quantum computing, except you now don't have to use weird symbols or remember how they're defined or thinking I have to take the entries of a matrix, invert them around the diagonal and take the complex conjugate. No, you just flip a box around. That's how it works. And as long as your equations, the equations of your language are correct or they can be interpreted correctly, then you will always derive the correct results without having to think about how these things are implemented. And you can combine these equations into larger equations because diagrams you can just cut around, you can remove some part, you can substitute it with some other part, and you can lift small equations to very large equations. So the, once you have a small equation, you can just compose it in all possible ways and you get all sorts of larger equations. So from a very simple, very succinct diagrammatic characterization, you can derive a lot of results. Now say that you want to do teleportation. Now you have two... Uh, uh, two people, Andra and uh, Blaze, they are at the opposite ends of the galaxy. They are not very happy about this. Uh, luckily, they have a friend, a friend who sends them two quantum particles that are entangled. So they share a link. You just draw this link as a wire. It's a, it's a small wire that links two parts, and then it goes all the way to the two ends of the galaxy. And then whatever they do, they do. I mean, Andra does something on her end, Blaze does something on his end, and you might think, well, Yes, but they are so far that it can't really have any effect. Now, can it? Well, as it turns out, it can. All you have to do to see that it can, in some sense at least, is that if you take something that Andrea did on her end, and you slide the box around, which you can, because this is the box on the wire, uh, then you see that actually something also happened on the other end by place. And this is kind of mind-blowing. And of course, it doesn't actually work like that, but it's a bit more complicated. But in certain cases, it does. So this has operational significance, and this is one of the things that puzzle physicists for decades. And it's just, it's just sliding the box around, really. You can conclude that something weird is going on by just taking a box and bending it all the way to the other side. And now you may ask, can I use this to do something useful? Can Andrea uh, send some package to Les, to the other end of the galaxy, without having to use a rocket, which is, let's face it, really expensive these days, and not very efficient. And this is what the teleportation protocol is about. It's about how can I send some information from one side to the other side by using quantum mechanics. And in fact, I will say, how can I do this by just using boxes and wires? Well, that's how you do it. That doesn't tell you how you implement it, really. I will go to that in a minute. But the principle is that as long as the two parties, Andrea and Blaze, share a state which has this connection that carries over, then one of them can just apply a cap. And this cap connects the package to this long wire that they already share. And then you can just slide. Uh, OK, this is not what I wanted to do. Yes, there you go. Then you can just slide the package around. Oh, ignore the first thing. First one shouldn't have a, like a U box there. It's fine. You just slide it around and it appears on the other. So as long, we know that as long as uh, Andrea can do something similar to plugging, connecting these two wires, then she can actually teleport things. That's good. That's essentially what we want. But that doesn't tell you what these boxes are. This is just uh, this is the scheme. This is the zeratum of the protocol. This is what you want to achieve. It doesn't immediately tell you how you're going to achieve this. How long do I have, by the way? Uh, just around five minutes. Now. All right, that's great. So in order to uh, understand better how you do this, you refine your language. So you say, my language can have many layers. Uh, at the highest layer, I only put some boxes as placeholders for the things that will happen, and I draw some equations that say what my protocol has to do. That's your specification. That's a formal specification. And as long as uh, you can refine your boxes in such a way that uh, this specification and the equations that they satisfy remain satisfied, 
then you're guaranteed that however you implement this, you're going to get the correct result in the end. So this is great for programming languages. This is what you want to do. You want to have a specification, and you want to be able to refine it and refine it and refine it by taking more and more basic boxes. And then you just have to check the equations from one layer to the next, nothing else. Now the simplest thing that you can do here is introduce what's known as a spider. And they are these colorful blocks. They're really boxes. They're just drawn as circles because they're prettier and 14-year-old uh, children can understand them better. And hopefully outperform physicists in doing this. But we'll see about that. And there's only one rule, really. Whenever they touch, they fuse. So if two spiders share at least one leg, then you can just fuse them together in some spider which has more legs. That's all you really have to care about. And you can make this formal. This can be made into a rigorous a visual language statement, which is an equation, well, a family of equations between these symbols. And you can enrich these a little bit by adding some angles, which encode some of these quantum mechanical rotations that you're interested in. And the rule is the same, it's just uh, you start the angles in the process. You can write them down as angles, if that's convenient for me as a mathematician, unfortunately with some classical training as well. Uh, but you can draw them as anything else. You can draw them as clocks if it makes your life easier, and that also works. It's just some visual cue as to what's going on. And you can also introduce more than one color. You can have two colors. You can have green spiders and red spiders, and uh, this is how traditionally the presentation of this particular language goes. And what they do is they are not compatible in the same way as spiders of the same color. They are incompatible. So whenever they share at least two legs, they just drop the legs. These legs get cut off. They wrestle and the legs fall. And these two equations are the only things that you really need in order to do the teleportation protocol. In fact, you can just get by by with fusion. So let's go back to what we wanted to implement. So we want to have uh, Andrew on one side, Les on the other side. Andrew has some wire which will carry whatever package she wants to send. Doesn't really matter what the package is. It's completely relevant. And the first thing she does is she applies two spiders, so two different colors. That's an operation she can do on her two types. And then what she would want to do is apply some other spiders in such a way that she gets these nice wire bands that will simplify. And this is where things go a bit wrong. The problem is that she can't force that to happen. One of four things will happen. So she can do what's known as a measurement in quantum mechanics, and that will have one effect. She just doesn't know which one. They're all equally likely. But the aim of the protocol is to show that whatever you do, it still works. And the point is, uh, we've seen that it will work in the first case, where you just have a wire band, because all you have to do is pull it taut, right? But then, so that's the first part. The first part is she, she's lucky. She gets these two spiders with no angles on them, and then these fuse together, disappear, and you just yank the wire. And the package goes around. She can be unlucky, in which case she gets some angles, which you can't really see because there's a lot of light here. But um, is there a pointer? You can't see the pointer because there's a lot of light as well. So here, there's two angles that might appear, which means that uh, it's not enough to just yank stuff together because the two angles will remain on the wire and they will be what's known as an error. So all she has to do is technically tell in some way to Blaze which angles she's observed. And then all that Blaze has to do is correct them. And how does it correct them? It just puts the opposite angle. The angles fuse, cancel out. Other angles fuse, cancel out. And you get the location as well. So in this way, we just uh, some wires, some boxes, <coughs> Uh, some colored dots and a rule as to how you fuse them together. You have essentially rediscovered a protocol that took quantum physicists and quantum information theorists something like 30 years to come up with. And you can teach this to a 14 year old. Probably you can teach it to someone younger than a 14 year old. But we'll start with 14 year olds. That's pretty much all. I think that's a uh, self-contained enough uh, presentation of why you might want to use these languages instead of other more formal, more verbose mathematical languages. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for having me here. It was a pleasure. And if you have any questions.
So those are in probably all close to 100 formal papers. Now, it's an uh, entire field that's called string diagrams or categorical quantum mechanics. Uh, there's a 960-page book as well that uh, talks about this. So these are these are drawn. It's uh, somewhat painful to draw them because text is not the best uh, the best thing. But there's also some diagrammatic editors that allow you to draw them. But yes, yes, they're very much formal. They've been two links. They've been published on the Journal of Physics. Yes. I'm assuming they're related to Feynman diagrams, at least tangentially. Yes, they are, and they aren't. They are related to Feynman diagrams. Uh, they are related to what's known as like the logical interpretation of Feynman diagrams uh, by Prakash Panangalan. Uh, but that's not strictly what Feynman diagrams in quantum field theories are. So there is some work as to categorifying quantum field theory, which is joint work between me and Fabrizio. It's ongoing. Uh, yes, they are. They are related to Feynman diagrams. They're not yet publicly related to Feynman diagrams, but they will. Give us some time. <laughs> no, any more. Keep the others here. Any more? Great. Yes. So the point with teleportation is that it appears as if there needs to be no physical connection. All they need to do is share a common past where this wire band can come from. The problem really is that uh, there is no way to enforce the outcome of the measurement. So if Alice on one end is lucky and she gets the correct outcome, then she knows that Blaze will have the correct answer. And uh, that happens. That's just, that requires no channel whatsoever. Unfortunately, Blaze has no way of knowing that. And uh, Blaze has no way of knowing what happened on Alice's side, or Andrea's side in this particular case. They changed the names last minute. By the way, this is what made science then happy, because uh, the idea is that you have to exchange classical information to tell which yeah. corrections have to be performed. And if this wasn't true, then you could transmit information instantaneously. And every Einstein fan would be very, very unhappy. Yeah, so no signaling constraints come from the fact that uh, Andrew on one side cannot enforce what the outcome is. So there has to be at least uh, two bits of information sent over somehow. But that's better than sending a quantum cattle. Yes, so that's slightly, that's easier. Because sending quantum stuff is really complicated uh, in these large refrigerators and it doesn't last very long while bits are really stable. So that, that's, the, that's the actual trick. But nonetheless, you can still interpret what it means for that particular outcome to happen, in which case, she knows that Blaze will have the correct thing, but Blaze might just trust it on faith. But she, she is certain. Yes? Um, Seems like this can be used in a way for cryptographic purposes, where you don't have to actually share the message, you can just share the error correction, and then they will get the right thing. The error correction can be completely public because nobody else except the original two people um, will know what actually was the result of the experiment. Yes, so there are. Um, uh, the answer is yes on both sides. There's uh, cryptographic protocols that do that in one way or the other, just like many variations. And some of these have already been formalized into, uh, into these languages. They tend to use, because they're multi-party scenarios, they tend to use non-locality as a resource. But you can write what non-locality means with these diagrams. It's actually, again, it's uh, fusing things. And there's one more equation that you need to exchange the two colors. But it's, it's almost equally simple. Yes, sorry, you were... Yeah, so uh, it's kind of a dumb question. So you could use this for communication, but you couldn't use this for my Amazon packages, right? <laughs> you mean teleportation? Yeah, the quantum <laughs> teleportation. Well, I really want right. Amazon Prime like within an hour. <laughs> well, um, yes, in principle, you could, why not? Yeah, okay, thanks. You could, it just needs, uh, essentially it just says that you can take some system, which is potentially very complicated and unstable, uh, you destroy the process, by the way. But um, if you share enough entanglement with some other party, they can destroy the system, send you the bits over the internet, and then you can reconstruct the system on your end. I don't recommend doing this to teleport anything which is alive, like human beings or cats, because you're not really teleporting them. 
teleporting an exact clone. This is a ship, right? Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's. It's. I don't think. Uh, I don't think I would use such a machine myself. But if it's for my Amazon package, then yes, yeah, that's fine. Cool. Yeah? May it turn out to be radioactive in progress. No, 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 no. You may get. You may do something wrong in uh, reconstructing it, and then there's an issue as to what the error tolerance is. But that's been studied. That's for someone else. I just have three guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have to go to the next speaker. Thanks a lot.